Today we're going to talk about the history of the atom, in particular the scientists and their contributions to the model of the atom that we have today. The best place to start, obviously, is the beginning, and we're going to just, we're going to start in BC times with Democritus. Democritus lived from 460 to 370 BC. Democritus proposed an atomic theory along with his mentor, Lysippus, and basically what he said um, was that the universe was made up of empty space and tiny bits of stuff that he just called atomos. He stated that all atoms are small, that they're hard, they're indivisible, and indestructible, so you cannot tear them apart. He said that they made up they were made up of a single type of material that was formed into different shapes and different sizes. The problem that uh, he ran into though was that Aristotle did not support his atomic theory. Aristotle was the main guy that everybody listened to. Um, so if Aristotle said it was no, then everybody just jumped on board and said, yeah, what he said. So the Atomos idea was buried for approximately 2,000 years. Okay, so we're going to fast forward now up to the 1700s, and we are going to meet Antoine Lavoisier. Antoine Lavoisier lived from 1743 to 1794, and he is known as the father of modern chemistry. He was the very first person to generate a list of elements, and he had a textbook, and he wrote down uh, all of the elements that he knew of, and he came up with 33 of them. You can thank Antoine Lavoisier for the metric system and not having, uh, not being able to use the customary system that we all use in the States. Um, he came up with it. He also discovered and proposed that combustion occurs when oxygen combines with other elements, so he liked to explode things, I guess. Um, that led him to discover the law of conservation of mass and or matter. They're basically the same thing. It states that in a chemical reaction, you're going to have matter neither be created nor destroyed. While Antoine Lavoisier really helped us develop an understanding of, of chemistry, he didn't do anything to help us understand what an atom looked like. Um, or a very basic building block of matter. So we had to go forward uh, another 10, 20, 30 years, and we are introduced to John Dalton. Okay, so in 1803, Dalton uh, proposed an atomic theory, and he stated that all substances were made of atoms. Um, he said that atoms are small particles, and they cannot be created, they cannot be divided, and they cannot be destroyed. He went further to say that atoms of the same element are exactly alike, and atoms of different elements are different. He also said that atoms join with other atoms to make new substances. So this right here is basically um, a solid sphere. That is what he said an atom looked like. Um, Dalton did build on the work of other scientists, the list that Lavoisier came up with, he calculated the atomic weights of many of those elements. Now that we understand uh, a little bit of what John Dalton came up with, who just happened to be the same as Democritus, or Democritus, um, we jump forward a little bit and we experience what J.J. Thompson, Thompson came up with. You're going to notice that a lot of these theories build on top of a previous scientist theory. J.J. Um, Thompson, he lived from 1856 to 1940. He proposed that an atom can be divided into smaller parts. So he said that Dalton was wrong. Um, Dalton and Democritus were wrong. They said that it couldn't be in, it could not be divided, and J.J. Thompson proved that it could. And he did this while experimenting with cathode ray tubes, which if you have the really old TVs or like the one that's in the classroom that we watch the morning announcements on, um, those TVs have cathode rays in them. And um, because of 
the use of a cathode ray tube, he discovered what he called corpuscles at the time, which we now know to be electrons. And what he concluded was that the atom is actually neutral. It does not contain a charge. Okay, so looking at this image right here, you will see the diagram that um, J. J. Tom of J.J. Thompson's experiment. So basically what he did was he shot these through, th shot this through the cathode ray tube and some things moved, the, l the beam would go up and some it would go down, showing that there was a positive or a negative charge. Um, and in 1897, he concluded the plum pudding model, which was a very popular dessert. Um, he was from England, and it was a very popular dessert of the time. So he stated that atoms consist of mostly um, consist of positively charged materials that have negatively charged particles, aka the electrons that are located throughout of the positive material. So here we have what Thompson um, concluded. You see the same sphere as Dalton, but now um, Dalton, uh, it's different from Dalton in that you see that the whole thing is positively charged, but the negatively charged electrons are spread throughout, which give it a neutral charge. Okay, so uh, fast forward a few years, and we are introduced to J.J. Thompson's student, who is Ernest Rutherford right here and um, we will discover what he does. Okay, so Ernest Rutherford lived from 1871 to 1930, 1937, and in 1909, he performed the gold foil experiment where he shot alpha particles at a piece of gold foil. So imagine aluminum foil, and now imagine that as gold. And he was shooting these particles um, at it. He did extensive work on radioactivity. Um, this is because of his work, we call him the father of nuclear physics because he dealt with alpha and beta particles and then gamma rays and waves. Okay, so this is just a mock-up of his experiment. He had a lead block and inside of the block was a pipe that had uranium in it. Um, surrounding the gold foil is a screen, it's a fluorescent screen. And basically, uh, what he expected was that the alpha particles would pass through without changing the direction. So this is what he expected based on um, the results of J.J. Thompson's experiment. Because he thought that the mass was evenly distributed within the atom. However, what he got was something completely different. In 1910, Rutherford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were scattered as they passed through a thin gold foil. Most of the alpha particles passed through undeflected. However, a few were found to be scattered at large angles, some even back in the direction from which they had come. This meant that they had collided with an object much more massive than the alpha particles themselves, yet so small that only a few alpha particles encountered them. This atomic level view shows what is happening. Most of the atom is occupied by the low mass electrons. The nucleus is small and massive. When an alpha particle encounters a nucleus, it is scattered at a large angle. The way Rutherford explained it was that the atom was mostly empty and there was a small, dense, positively positive piece in the center. Um, we know that to be the nucleus. Alpha particles were deflected by it if they got close enough. So um, it would make sense for the particles to come through, but then if they got really close, they turned around, and that's how they were deflected and bouncing all over the place. So what does this tell us about the atom? Well, one, it tells us that it consists of a small core, or the nucleus, and that contains most of the mass of the atom. The nucleus is made up of particles called protons, which have a positive charge. The protons are surrounded by negatively charged electrons, but most of the atom is actually empty space. So you've got your nucleus here, and you've got your little teeny tiny electrons 
that are going around the atom and almost all of this is empty. So we believed um, Ernest Rutherford for quite a while until Niles Bohr came along and changed our way of thinking. Okay, in 1913, Niles Bohr uh, proposed the Bohr model, which suggests that electrons travel around the nucleus in an, an atom in orbits or definite paths. Additionally, the electrons can jump from one path, one level, to a path in another level, totally depending on their energy level. And to correct myself, I do believe uh, he pronounced his name Niels Bohr, not Niles. Um, but basically, we know this as the planetary model um, because it's like the sun is right here in planet's orbit. So according to uh, Bohr, the electrons orbited the nucleus. And this was something that uh, we believed for quite a while until Erwin Schrödinger came along. Erwin Schrödinger lived from 1887 to 1961, and in 1926, he further explained the nature of electrons in an atom by stating that the exact location of the electron absolutely cannot be known. Um, he said it was more accurate to view the electrons in regions, and we called those electrons clouds. So basically what he said were there were places where the electrons are most likely to be found. So if you look at this image right here, you will see that um, electrons are dotting all over the place. They're just constantly in motion. Uh, the location of the electron depends on how much energy the electron has. He did extensive work on this, and he came up with a, the wave formula, which became Schroding, the Schrodinger equation, or led to the Schrodinger equation. And finally, um, we developed a better understanding of what the atom looks like uh, with the help of James Chadwick. James Chadwick, who lived from 1891 to 1974, actually realized that the atomic mass of most elements was double the number of their protons. And what he discovered was the neutron in 1932. And he concluded that the particle carried no charge. So now let's look at the progression of the atomic model over time. Okay, so according to our notes, the structure of the atom that was just a dense ball or sphere and the answer would be Democritus, Democritus and John Dalton. From John Dalton we concluded that there was uh, something that uh, had a completely positive charge overall, um, but it was negative throughout as well, and that belonged to J.J. Thompson. Then we took it a step further and realized that electrons were spread throughout surrounding the nucleus and that belonged to Ernest Rutherford. From there, the atomic model progressed in that we put the electrons in specific orbits, and we can thank Niles Bohr for that. Then came along the idea that electrons existed in clouds, um, that we couldn't pinpoint the exact location, and we owe that to Erwin Schrödinger. And finally, uh, we discovered not only do elect electrons exist in clouds, but besides the proton being in the nucleus, there were also neutrons, which had no charge, and we can thank James Chadwick for that.